just to give you um, a little situation, Bros pretty much, in my opinion, had everything going for it. Um, they were set to make history as, you know, the first gay romantic comedy to um, basically have the backing of a major studio, which would be Universal. Um, you know, Billy Eigner starring in it. In my opinion, Billy Eigner is not that big of a major star, so I'm surprised that they took a chance on him. But you know what? They did think they've done that with a lot of people in the past who weren't really that well known. A lot of people didn't know Amy Schumer when um, Trainwreck was this big thing, but she was surrounded by a lot of people who elevated her role and made me want to go see this film. And it was also word of mouth. So they had everything going for it. Like you had like this major studio. They had a huge budget. Um, they were heavily promoting this thing everywhere. Like I was seeing a lot of the previews. I was seeing a lot of the trailers. I was seeing a lot of the promotion. They were on The View. They were on Hoda and the other girl, whatever her damn name is, one of the Bush twins. Um, you know, they were on, what was it? The the Hollywood Reporter. They were everywhere. They even had the backing. They even had their celebrity friends from this movie. Chris Evans was wearing a bros t-shirt telling like you should go see this film. Uh, Mariah Carey was promoting it. Mariah of all people. Yeah, Mariah Carey, you had Sarah Silverman, you had all these different famous people that were out here telling about you should go say bro, blah, 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 blah. Then the movie came out. I saw like Rotten Tomatoes gave it a great review. A lot of critics were saying that they loved it. Everyone who's seen the film, I've heard they say it's pretty funny. So what went wrong? The budget of the film was $22 million and brought in under $5 million. So it was like 4.4 or 4.8, something like that. It's under $5 million, we'll say that. So what went wrong? I have a couple of theories, but before we get to those theories, I think I wanna play some of these clips because you know, I've been gathering a lot of information. I've been talking back and forth with people on social media about this very topic. And I've been following it on Twitter and stuff as well. And I've pretty much gathered up all my assessments and I've talked about it ad nauseum all over my social media, but I'm like, I'm getting it in video form. So that way I can just collectively get it all together. So before we get to my assessment, in my opinion, let's play these clips. Oh, it's a breakdown. Media is obsessed with white gays. They have been for decades. White men, are first and foremost accepted in society. So who do you think is gonna be at the forefront of acceptance for homosexuality? White gay men. And it is a story told over and over and over again. What did you think was gonna happen when you put yet again, white men at the lead of gay representation in the media in a box office premiere? Do you think that BIPOC gay men and women and non-binary people are gonna go rushing into theaters to watch it? No. We're not gonna go pay $19 for a ticket to a movie for something that we see every day. White gay men getting praised and uplifted and accepted before other people that marginalize groups in the gay community. Just like this movie, and like this movie, and this one, and this one, just to name a few. You know that Taylor Swift song? I think I've heard this song before, and I didn't like the ending, hello. I'm not surprised that Billy Eichner, a white gay, is blaming the lack of success for this film on the heterosexual community. And not realizing that the, maybe this movie just lacks a lot of representation for marginalized groups in the gay community that he should have probably put into the film. Maybe even making the other main male character a person of color. And I know that some people find Billy Eichner problematic. Um, to me, he's a miniature Perez Hilton to some extent, but I don't think he's the worst person ever. I do think this movie was the ego boost he's been wanting for a while though. Some sort of validation, and that's fine. I'm used to white gays wanting to be validated, but they are constantly validated in the media. And that's the image that sticks with heterosexual people that are learning about the gay community. <laughs> I cried the first time I saw that damn TikTok. And he said he's like a miniature for his own. It's really, really that problematic. I mean, look, he's atoned, in my opinion, to try to be, you know, to try to do a little better and stuff. We'll get to the T.S. Madison one for a minute. I mean, in a minute, I'll, you know, pivot to it. But I feel like there was a lot of things that was going bad for it. Number one, you released the movie 
on the last day, what was it, September 30th, which was going into October. I knew it was going to be a bad idea from the beginning because nobody goes to see rom-coms in fucking October. This is a month where Halloween trumps everything. I understand that, what is it, um, LGBT Awareness Month or something or another, because I know we have Pride Month in June, but I think it's like where it's about like um, queer history, that sort of thing. So I, maybe that was the reason why they, they released it around that time. But nobody knows about that shit. First of all, everybody knows October is just festered and fully booked for Halloween. So you were expecting gays to show up to a movie where it was about a guy, some insecure, loud, abrasive, nerd, white guy with a lot of money who was bitching about he ain't got enough. When, you know, the red carpet is rolled out for people like a Billy Eichner in life. See, we're about to get into this whole White Lives Matter shit in a minute. <laughs> But with this story, it's just sort of like, here's this privileged white gay male who wants to tell a story about a guy who's so fulfilled everywhere else, but he's unfulfilled in his relationship. We've seen this play out a million times in other ways. And I feel like we're at a time where he's one of those people that's just so loud and abrasive. He doesn't read the room. Like he doesn't know when he's being annoying or he doesn't understand like when people are like, okay, girl, like, you had the, the time to put this out. This would have probably worked if it was released maybe seven to 10 years ago. But now it's like, um, movies centered around white people isn't what people want to see anymore. Because we've had those movies made already. As you saw in the video, it's like, we've seen it in Brokeback Mountain. We've seen it in so many other films where white gays have been the center. If you go on any, like any section, LGBT, either, I don't even know if they even have those, but I know like if you had like, okay, I, I guess any of the streaming services, they, I'm sure there are queer centric, like Deku is one, for example, that I can think of off the top of my head. If you were to go on there and you would look at their, reg, their roster of queer films, how many of them on there are centered around people of color? There aren't that many. So, and then there was this meme that was going around that I found hilarious, and I love that that shit was trending. They were like, name a movie that's way more entertaining than bros. And people were like, Trick, um, Brokeback Mountain. They said, um, what was the other damn movie? Um, Noah's Ark Jumping the Broom. We also seem to forget that there was a movie that came out earlier this year that y'all kind of just brushed the, oh, they, Moonlight, there was another one. But Moonlight was min, uh, limited release. That film wasn't even given like the um, common courtesy of getting a wide release. I remember when myself and I took DJ, this was around the time when I was working at AMC. And we actually went to see that movie. It was literally like maybe five, six people in the theater. And it was a great movie, but it was given a limited release. I think it got more of a wider release when um, when there was, a, you know, the nominations and the Oscar buzz and all that stuff came about. I think that's when they got more attention drawn to that film. Read the screen. You want me to read that? <laughs> Okay, so um, what I would love to say is that, okay, so, and then also let's not forget B-Boy Blues. That movie didn't get any kind of attention. I mean, of course y'all decided to dick right off the fact that y'all wanted to call Jesse Smollett problematic, but that aside, there have been people who have done far worse and gotten away with far more but then y'all wanted to just you know you wanted to go in on jesse smell over that thing but overall b-boy blues is a great movie and shout out to um oh my god what the hell's his name the 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 musician that's in the film oh my god i forgot his name that's in the movie that's been like retweeting every damn thing b-boy blues hell i forget his name bryant thank you came to my head he retweeted what I said, because I was like, all this attention y'all putting on bros, but where was that energy when it came to B-Boy Blues, 
and Fire Island, which in my opinion, Fire Island was a great movie. I liked it. There were certain things about it that could have been better, but overall, it was a cute little rom-com. That didn't get any kind of attention. I mean, it got a little attention. They got to do the little premieres and stuff. But for the most part, it was dumped on Hulu. That was another thing with Billy Eichner. He kind of thumbed his nose at streaming services and thought his film was beneath it. No, y'all are beneath me. He thought his movie was above streaming, that it didn't even need to go to streaming. Streaming, in my opinion, is the future. I feel like he didn't read the room. The fact of the matter is, post-pandemic, a lot of people aren't going to the movies anymore. Me personally, my, my taste in movies is action movies and horror movies and superhero movies. Like, I already got my tickets for Black Adam. And I'm there, and I already got my ticket for, for Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. So maybe if you would have made this movie a, like the first big action film featuring gay leads, or if it was like a gay James Bond, I ain't saying they gotta be gay James Bond, but just something in that world, like a gay spy or something, a lot of action, a gay superhero movie, a gay horror film with a queer cast. I think that would have been more groundbreaking. I think more people would have shown up to that because it needed to be relatable to the characters. So that's one of the reasons why I feel. There's so many other reasons. We'll get to that in a second. But first, let's get to this clip of T.S. Madison and the other one talking. Good, how are you? Another movie. Yeah. You are doing it. Thank you. I mean, you've been inspiring us for so long. Your answer was first your personality and now your amazing acting career. Uh, talk about a little bit about this moment and what it means to you. Um, this moment means the world. For me, it means the world for so many people that look like me, um, black and gay. Um, it means that no longer do our queer youth, our LGBTQ youth, and those who never got their just do have to uh, wonder if they deserve space or deserve to take up space in the film and television industry where we tell our own stories played by us, written by us. Um, and so for that, I feel like this is a very magical moment, one that I did not see coming when I was a little boy or girl or when I was a little when I was a little baby queen. What about your role in this movie? We're so excited uh, to see you. you know, I'm a part of the board, you know, we're we're primary cast in the movie, you know, and I'm a black trans woman that is on the board of directors and we're trying to make decisions on, you know, where queer people, where, where you know, trans people, every person fits, you know, in the, in the scheme of LBGTQ museum. You know, it should be in real life, please. Well, in real life, it would be much, much larger, a much larger boardroom than that because, you know, there are so many different areas and so many different spectrums of our community and you know i'm just honored to be a part of this whole this whole thing as t.s madison honey come on you know you're so booked and busy tell me how you keep it all together uh <laughs> it gets difficult at times at times it gets very difficult because i am so busy but i always make time to do something well, congratulations to y'all being the token blacks of the LGBT board of directors. But from what I heard, y'all barely have enough screen time in the damn movie. And if anything, Billy Eichner's character basically just dominates the damn boardroom. Like, he dominated the whole movie. So when you're saying they're written for us, it wasn't written for y'all. It was written by Billy Eichner and the director, two white people who are trying to, who I guess wanted to incorporate from what I heard, because I have not seen the movie. There's a reason why I haven't seen the movie. I'm not paying $20 to go see no damn romantic comedy. I don't care if it's two men or a man, woman and a man. I've never paid that kind of coin. I was gonna wait for it to come on the streaming service. So, and I believe it's gonna come to Peacock because that's universal. But for the most part, it's like, I am very selective about what I go to see to go in the movies. And me also is like, who is this movie geared towards? Because when Billy Eichner tweets such things like everyone who isn't a homophobic weirdo should go see bros tonight, you will have a blast. And it is special and uniquely powerful to see this particular story on a big screen, especially for queer folks who don't get this opportunity often. So when you go and put it in that way, it feels very token tokenism like there's some tokenisms up in there it's like let's start let's check the box and i feel like that's not even just with billy eichner i think it's a problem that hollywood is doing they don't understand how to incorporate different people into things 
be it a strong female character, people of color, gender, you know, people of different genders and sexual orientation. I don't really feel like they've figured out how to into the shows and their films without having to make it like to me. One of the things I've always loved about like with good writing, it's okay, he's a doctor, he's a lawyer, he's all these he just so happens to be gay. It's not that being LGBT is your all is all of your identity. It's all of who you are. It's a part of who I am. I'm proud to be, you know, that's a part of who I am, but that's not all of who I am. And when you take a whole movie and you expect that to just be your entire existence, that's when you go wrong. I also heard there's a scene in the film where um Billy Eigner's character, Bobby, I don't know, Chad, you couldn't have come up with something more clever than that, um, gets into a, a heated discussion with um, Luke McFarlane's mother, the character, you know, the guy he's dating, the muscle queen. He gets into it with the mother because the mother is a person who teaches second grade. And he was talking about, well, are you te- are, in so many ways, are they learning about, you know, LGBT stuff in school? My opinion, second grade, you shouldn't be learning about shit like that. I should be like, trying to get an education. I didn't even know about penis and sex and what I was into when I was in the second grade. I wasn't thinking about that at my age. So I understand like we want to bring, you want kids to learn about LGBTQ history and I'm here for that. I'm all for people learning about our history. However, and also, I don't know how I feel about someone like a Billy Arkin trying to teach me about Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera when I already know about them hoes. May they rest in peace. <laughs> but I don't need some white man trying to mansplain or queer explain to me about LGBT history pertaining to people of color. You could have probably had somebody like uh, Miss Lawrence and Maddie's characters talking about them. Because in a way, you could have incorporated maybe a scene about what it's like for them to be trans or whatever, but you wanted to circle this film about around you being a cis white gay man in New York, which outside of that, that's another thing too, the marketing. Who was this film for? Because when I would read stuff, I mean, he said Rolling Stone already had bros on the list of the best comedies of 21st century child. Who's still reading Rolling Stone? That was another thing. You didn't market this thing to Gen Z. Gen Z, in my opinion, is also the biggest um, group demographic that is coming out more and more. Gen X, okay, some of them are out, some of them are still going through their shit. And millennials, yeah, there, there's like a lot of them that have come out, but they're not at the extent of Gen Z. Gen Z is more comfortable than ever that have come out, you know, being their, you know, being their queer selves. So, um, to me, it feels like they're the ones who are more, um, that you should be gearing this more towards. Nobody wants to see 40 something gay men falling in love or trying to find love. That's not gonna work in a major film. That would have, that, that's not what's gonna get people to come out to the theaters. Gen X, you know, of the older audiences are not coming out to see movies like that. They're working, they're trying to pay bills. The younger generation is the ones who got the disposable income in some sort of way, one way or another. Um, also, girls are the ones who mostly watch rom-coms. Straight guys are not going to watch a rom-com. The girlfriends are ones who are dragging the boyfriends to go see this because they're guaranteed to get some pussy at the end of the night. So that's the reason why a lot of them are going. So you... And also, who are you catering this to? Because you said it was for straight people. Like, to me, it felt like you were trying to pander this movie to straight people. It wasn't the us. And from what I was hearing, what people were complaining is that they felt like a lot of the stuff that you were putting in the film about, um, you know, masculinity and all these things that go in our community, it's like cringe and they were uncomfortable. I have to see the movie to give full context, but I'm just telling you what I feel is what possibly went wrong with this movie.